Hi there, this is the first in a series about tone compressors in Darktable. That means uh, one is filmic RGB and the second one is sigmoid. Now this is just the first part. The truth is I actually started filming this as one video and when I got to about 45 minutes and hadn't finished I decided I'm going to split this into parts. This is the first part uh, because I realised that Tone compressors aren't just about compressing the lightness, the light values onto the screen. It's also about conserving colors. And I think the color part is the most important thing. And it's something I didn't address in the previous video, which was about Filmic, which I made a while ago. So this is the first part. And there will be, uh, in this mini series, several other parts coming. I think I'll do it at least in three, where I'll talk about tone compressing in other software like Lightroom Capture One, and photo lab and compare it to what dark table does maybe also talk about exposure which is paramount the exposure slider is the main um, point we need to get right when we're doing uh, filmic and sigmoid and then at last at the end of the series i'm sorry if you have to wait we will actually talk about how to adjust filmic and sigmoid so there we are this is the first part enjoy it now I'd like to start by reminding you of what we have, what we call scene referred workflow and display referred workflow. So I've drawn here, I call it real life. It's called the scene and it is a graduated line starting at zero, which is pitch black, right up to the brightest of the brightest of the brightest lights. It is unbounded. Um, if memory serves me well, the unit we use is candela per square meters. And we have different amounts of light. Um, uh, what we have also, sorry, is a display. And the display is very bounded because we go from 0% black on the screen or on a print to 100%, which is the white. When we take a photo, let's take a photo, low contrast photo. We're going to capture a portion of this uh, line. Um, from this luminosity to this luminosity, this amplitude. I'm not going to say dynamic range because I think I remember dynamic range is not an amplitude, but a ratio. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, I'll duplicate this. And oh, look, I've got a second photo which has the same amplitude, but was taken in brighter light. Now, if we were realistic, then this photo here, we could imagine that when we print it, well, we get something very black. Well, not very interesting. We get an entirely black photo because it was taken in a dark room. And if I have a bright summer's day, maybe I want to print a photo of a very bright light and just get white or partially white. It'd be fun. Um, I'm not sure it's very interesting um, for a photographer to do that. So that's not how the software we use works. What happens is that we have things in Darktable called Filmic and Sigmoid. In all the other software it's called, well, I don't know what because it's a secret, but there is something that does that, which will map out the values. Well, I'm going to put them here and here, but they could be from black to white. Um, well, that will dis de depend on the user, what uh, the user of the software wants to do. So in reality, there's no difference in display between a dark photo and a bright photo. If you look here, this is a dark photo taken on. Yes, it was summer. It was raining. It was dark. It was gray. It was dreadful. If you look at the histogram, we have the darkest darks around here to the lightest lights up here. Bright summer's morning, very sunny, very bright. We have bright whites. On the histogram to the right, the darkest darks, we have some very dark darks around here. It's the same information on the screen. Now, why is one representing bright light and the other representing something dark and dismal? Well, that's the photographer's job to do that when he's developing the photo. But it's not the display that's going to do it for you. Now, for Filmic Sigmoid to work properly or for that matter, in any software, these things come kind of very late in the pipeline. I will modify my photo here, the data, I will be modifying it. 
um, I might be changing exposure, changing contrast, and then I want to map it to the screen the latest possible. That is the best way of how we understand it at the moment to um, get good quality photo realistic uh, images. Now, moving exposure, the illusion is that I'm actually moving the data up to the right. We'll see a bit later that for um, dark table, it's not quite what we're doing, but the illusion is good for the moment. So we're moving it up and I want to move it back and I want the data to stay um, kind of complete whole and I don't want any problems when I do that. Um, notice I'm not doing it on the display where I can reach problems. I'm doing it here, which is unbounded. I also might want to add contrast, which would be doing something like uh, this, kind of expanding the data. So I'm not in the real life, the scene anymore. I'm in a physical, uh, mathematical world doing that, which behaves like real life. Um, let's have a look um, on Affinity Photo, what happens when I do that. Now, here is an image that I made of two gradients. Um, so it's an artificial test image, really, if you'd like, just to uh, prove a point. So I have oranges, um, same hue all the way through, going from um, very kind of dark to light. And here I have a blue, which is the same hue throughout, going from desaturated to saturated. That's just to try. Now, I want to test, see what happens when we add and remove exposure, which means that we're actually sliding the photo along the line. This is what I like to do and see in different software what happens when I do that. So whether it's Photoshop, I could do the same thing in Photoshop or Affinity. We end up with the same, uh, exactly the same. So let's add an adjustment layer, which is exposure. And we'll adjust exposure, we'll move it up. So we're making things lighter. Now I can go to bright white if I like. That's not what, what I want to do. But something strange is happening because when I'm moving up, my orange has become yellow. That is not what I'd like in a photo when something's underexposed and you overexpose and we get a hue shift. This one is kind of the big hue shift. So that is one thing. So I have something that's not happening properly, or not as I'd like. And there's something else is that if I have one exposure adjustment and I add a second one and I move this down, so I was at plus three on the first, I'll type in minus three on the second, and what's happened, the overall image has gone darker. That is not really what I wanted because plus three, minus three, I'd expect it to come back to zero. Now let's try and explore why that's happening. So here we are in Excel a spreadsheet. I had some help I found online, a macro that enables me from a value of red, green and blue to show the actual color and to calculate the hue. Formulas there, don't understand it, uh, it works. So the idea, I took a, an orange color from the uh, previous image, uh, the one that was um, the original one somewhere around here. And I've simulated what happens if I over, well, increase the exposure by adding 10 to each of the three channels. So from 250, 240 to 250, 165 to 175, and 48 to 58. Now what happens very quickly is we, we reach 255, and 255 on a display is the maximum value for one of the channels. Each value goes between zero and 255 to make up all the colors. So what is happening is that the red is limited to 255 very quickly. Green re goes up and up and up until it reaches 255 and the last to reach 255 is blue. So we, the actual ratio between the three channels will change if one of them is blocked and the two others carry on increasing. And that explains why there's a difference in hue. And when I look at the hues, and these values, I get the exact same colors as the ones I had when I added three exposure in Affinity. Now, 
that's what happens when I slide my photo up the scale. So what I've done here is I have, I'm just increasing exposure. And here the exposure is increasing, but I have a shift in colors. And what's even worse is that when I shift downwards again, so what happened is I took one of these hues, 255, 255, 208, which I found here, plugged it into this column and just started shifting everything downwards by 10. So removing 10 on each of the three channels. So they will actually stop going down when they reach zero. So I have a lot of time before that happens. And if you look, if you look at these colors here, they are, well, not as bright. This is a sunset, oranges, whatever you like. If I'm moving the exposure downwards, then look at what I get. You go into the browns, the murky greens, not very pleasant. And the hue is 60. Now let's check the theory. This is a test I did. And if I go to the original image, go on the color picker, let's pick a color and let's go to color. Yeah, color. So hue here, 37, and I can click, I go in the blues, 251, but I'm at 37 all over the place. When I increase the exposure and I click again, look, I'm at 60 everywhere. Um, so what I showed you in Excel seems to be what is happening. And if I kind of get something in between, I'm at 37. If we keep keeping on this number here, 37, and as I go up the scale, 41, 44, 47, 49, etc., etc., we do have a hue shift, which is predicted by what I, the table I showed you in the spreadsheet. So what is happening really is that the photo isn't here. The photo is here. Affinity in Photoshop, same thing in Photoshop. I'm here. When I increase, I reach 100. Everything that's over 100 is clipped. And when I move, so the colors shift. So I'm not only losing luminosity and details, I am losing um, color information. And when I move down again, well, what has vanished um, doesn't come back and the colors have changed. So, well, the temporary conclusion to that is editing photos in Photoshop Affinity in these pixel based editors, they are all display referred. And not the best then, not the best. So this is the end of the first part of the series. And I hope that I've managed to convince you all that the we need to have um, a tone compressor that can not only conserve luminosity, but can also that can conserve colors. Um, next time, we'll have a look at what commercial software do, how they handle it, uh, namely Lightroom, Capture One and DxO Photo Lab. And we'll be going back to Darktable to see how Darktable manages that. Okay, we can see you soon.